Good morning, Matt Waldman. It's like week five, and it seems like all of a sudden football got better, or at least some of it, right? Got for real, I guess. The preseason's yeah. over. The 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 pre po- the post preseason, should we call it that? Or the, know, well, it's, wake the it's fuck October. up. Yeah, it's October, <laughs> which means it's the new September. Because September is now August, and uh, like forties, the new thirty, all that kind of dumb I shit. Sixty yeah. was the new thirty. That's what I was hoping for. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> for the obvious reasons. So, hi, You're I'm ahead Bob of your Harris. Time. <laughs> I'm Bob Harris. He's Matt Waldman. Welcome to Feel It or Fuck It. We're gonna decide some things here and plant some flags and and sort things out. You can find both of us at Football Guys uh, <clears throat> throughout the week. Also, Matt Waldman. Dot com for the RSP and associated materials. I got a nice newsletter last week. It was joyous. Always appreciate that. Uh, and you can also catch me on Sirius XM Fantasy Sports Radio pretty much every damn day. If you want to avoid me, it's going to be hard. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, In your face. To, uh, deal with it, people. <laughs> Feel it or fuck it. Uh, <laughs> the Ravens. Oh, so, so it was a great overtime game with tons of scoring was the... Uh, the AFC North division game, the Ravens and Bengals. Was that the best game of the season so far? For me, it was. It was the best game I've watched so far. <laughs> and I know everybody was talking about it was all offense, but there were a lot of fun defensive moments in that game, too. People, people even fuck the defense, man. This is about offense. Hey, Come listen, not not in this household, man. I've got a <laughs> I got a box safety that was looking pretty bored when he was watching all this offense and then and then he watched um, Marlon Humphrey cut off uh, um, Jamar Chase. He watched Namdi um, Matabuike, you know, with some really nice QB hits and some stunts and and Roquan Smith heading downhill. Uh, I mean, stuff. there was some good stuff it's there. Good stuff. Okay, well, okay. Well, I mean, look, you know, certainly Jamar Chase looked awesome, you know, in terms right. of what he was able to do. Joe Burrow was on fire. I, I certainly loved the... You know, you saw the moments from Chase Brown and what they were able to do in the run game. Both ground games, honestly, it was a back and forth affair with the what the defense was doing and then how the offense had to overcome it. Um, and of course, Lamar Jackson. I mean, Lamar Jackson probably erased more bad plays um, than than you most quarterbacks have to, and he has to do that on a weekly basis. And it showed, and he. You know, he didn't erase one. Of, he erased even one of his own bad plays, and then he had one come and bite him. But I think the football gods, if there is such a thing, kind of said, look, you've erased so many other people's bad plays. We're going to let the Bengals kicker erase the, the worst possible play at the worst moment with the fumbled snap. And then, you know, it was just a back-and-forth affair, which you love. And it wasn't, it, while it was a lot of scoring, there was a good enough balance of obstacles in these quarterbacks and running backs and, you know, players' paths, that it wasn't that they were just, like, rolling over and saying, yeah, just tread all over us. Yeah, I thought it was great. The the Ravens' rushing game remains on point, we could just say. I want to look up, but there's a number here. Uh, The Ravens, let's see. The rushing attack. The Ravens have, uh, they have outrushed their opponent by at least 100 yards in all five games this season. Yeah, and... And there were some difficulties there, too, because as um, John Harbaugh said at the half, he said, you know, they're presenting blitz fronts and run fronts that are kind of um, making it tough on us, and we're going to have to figure out a way to get them out of that. And one of them was Hubbard getting a safety on Derrick Henry, you know, in the first half of the game. Um, You know, so it wasn't like it was all easy for those guys. But it's cool how the Ravens use both Henry and Justice Hill. Like, you can plug Justice Hill in now. And you and what I love about him is that he gets he is a very shifty, speedy back, but he's one of those backs that just says, "No, listen, I get the ball, and there's a downhill crease, and I'm hitting that sucker as hard as possible, and not going to try and get too cute with it." Do we feel a little concerned? Are we worried at all about uh, Keaton Mitchell coming in and maybe you know upsetting the fine balance? Because I, I agree with you. I think Justice Hill's a guy you could you know with we've got buys coming up, people. There's all kinds of attrition going on. We'll talk about some of that as well. But he felt like a guy you could plug in as a flex level play. Is does, does Keaton Mitchell upset the apple cart if he returns? And and we don't have a timetable on that. He's just he'll be eligible soon. It's potentially the case, but I would say right now. Ride Justice Hill for as long as you can. Look, if you need, we a haven't back even said Derrick Henry yet. Let's say the word. 
put some respect on them. Derrick Henry, the great Derrick Henry, who I oh, have that's, many assistants. That's uh, that's presumed. I mean, listen, I know, it's presumed. listen. I two weeks. Ago, I just want to say this. Two weeks. I think three weeks ago, I got Derrick Henry for a second round pick. Um, yeah, in a dynasty league. Oh, in a win now situation, you. yeah, good and 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 I'll say oh, that think, Sigmund Bloom great. was mad because he got this, he got a similar offer, and he was like, "Oh shit, I need to like get on this," and literally and called me twenty that. minutes later, and he was like, "Sure enough, he goes, you got offered it too." So, all right, so yeah, let's dig time. into this. Uh, some of the other side, like Derrick Henry is rocking the world, as we all know. Joe Burrow, uh, like I keep feeling for this guy. Like every year, there is something that keeps him from hitting the ground running. You know, the ACL, the COVID, the, the uh, wrist. appendectomy, the wrist, the, the calf, then the wrist. I mean, you know, but g- going into a season, hitting the ground running, and we see this game, you know, the the, the production was phenomenal. Five touchdowns is, is good stuff. <clears throat> is, is, this, is this Joe Burrow? Is this the Joe Burrow we should expect at some point on the regular? Absolutely. Joe Burrow, to me, is one of the three best passing talents um, in the NFL or, or in the world today. Um, he throws with great anticipation. He knows how to layer throws. He doesn't have the great arm that people go nuts over, the Josh Allen type of arm that can throw a hole through somebody's chest to get the ball to a to a receiver. But Burrow knows how to like paint the corners and work around. He's like the Greg – he could be the Greg Maddox of, of – of quarterbacks That's and if a you don't know reference we don't do that here <laughs> i'm in atlanta we do that here we're gonna call an audible because greg maddox is greg maddox is a good exception yeah football, football right. i know i'm not a big baseball guy but greg maddox right. was a stud um so you know burrow burrows at, i mean there were some throws in that game the throw to josevis um uh, from the opposite hash to the far sideline <clears> um <throat> where he had pressure literally hitting him in the chest from Namdi Matabuike, he he puts that ball only where Yosivas has a chance to get it. In the red zone, his placement was fantastic. Just, I mean, the two touchdowns to, to T. Higgins were underrated throws because he put it where Higgins was the only one that was going to be able to make the play between defenders. And he... He can do that in so many different instances, and he's unstoppable on sale routes. That throw to Jacecki makes you understand why they got Mike Jacecki, Mr. Concrete Feet. Looks like he's running in wet concrete, but who has that great length to be able to extend and win the ball. Uh, you know, throwing a, a sail route at the boundary to him is pr- practically unstoppable, um, and you could see evidence of that. And he's just so good at moving around in the pocket. To me, I mean, this is where Brock Purdy could be heading, but may never quite get there. Um, but Burrow is the top of the line of that spectrum of player. Um, and I, with with his full complement of weapons, a good run game, I I love it. I would like to see him have like an like the fantasy guys should smile on all of us and give him a good summer with all of his components in place, everybody working happily, and him being on point when he hits the ground in September. Which I know it's the new August. But yeah, but just make make it September for one I, year. Come I on. understand, but if you look at the Bengals helmets real closely, those aren't tiger stripes; oh. those are Charlie Brown stripes, <laughs> and fair. so so they are um, the Charlie Brown of the <clears throat> AFC North. Um, okay, Lucy, lighten up. Eric All sees a uh, is is getting I'm a Snoopy, little more butt. You. Uh, are you? Yeah, I I. The same butt. Yeah. I can see you in that booth though, charging me a nickel for your my therapy. Um, <laughs> that's just so, yeah, I can I can imagine that. Here. That's just at, at least in this day. that that's my front. You know, I'm <laughs> I'm usually at my doghouse playing you know playing Red Baron, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so Eric Hall is uh, is becoming a thing. Like the workload's increasing. He's been on the field a lot in the two tight end sets. Now we're seeing him in the three receiver sets as the lone tight end. Uh, more. He didn't catch a ton of passes, but is you see him gaining momentum. Yeah, he's, this is a guy that I would want to be buying into <laughs> if I have the opportunity as a throw into trades and dynasty for sure. Um, he's a guy you're going to want to keep an eye on um, pretty much every week to make sure to, to monitor that snap count because if Mike Giusecki has any type of setbacks, injuries, types of things like that, um, 
all could get in there. What's most exciting about him from just a pure football standpoint that lends to his potential as a fantasy player is how good of a blocker he is. They're using him as a fullback in I formation sets, and he's just taking people out. Um, and then what you get as a reliable guy, and look at Bob, he's just bored because we talk about blocking as opposed to like catching the football. But like <laughs> Eric all around. Uh, Eric all around. But he does have a deep game that hasn't been unlocked yet. So I think as he has a full season returning from the ACL, like by next year, you're going to see them probably open up his game to the intermediate and deep passing game. He can go up and win a football. So, yeah, this might be one of the – I don't know if he's ever going to be George Kittle, but I think that he could be on that spectrum as one of the better all-around tight ends in football within the few years. What can Charlie Kolar of the Ravens be uh, besides a impediment to the players we currently want to produce producing? He can he can succeed Mark Andrews in the Mark Andrews role. He was you know when they drafted Likely and Kolar. Kolar was the earlier pick, I believe, if I remember correctly. If not, Kolar was the guy who was most like Mark Andrews. Very good in zone coverage. Someone who can make the really tough catches take the contact, can give you a little bit more as a blocker than likely can, but maybe not as much as like someone like Eric Hall. But he's a he's a good move tight end who can give you some versatility. And so he may end up having a career as the second tight end um, in an offense. But if he ends up somewhere else um, on another team, second contract, he might have a shot to start and give you a, maybe a plus version of Hunter Henry. You, you okay. know, that could be right. pretty good. All right, so let's put a fine point on this uh, this situation, the, the Bengals at least. Uh, uh, the LSU contingent is speaking loudly. Um, at wide receiver, Justin Jefferson, Jamar Chase, now my guy Malik Neighbors. Uh, is Jamar Chase the best wide receiver in the world? Feel it or fuck it. One word. Hell yes. Damn it, that was two. Okay. No, it's one, yeah, so it's, it's one in the South. That, oh, that's fair. <laughs> Bless your heart. Uh, that, that's fair. Um, so, is it even close? I mean, like Justin Jefferson and Malik Neighbors, who, who who's in the conversation? I think they're both in the conversation for sure. I think Devontae Adams still is in the conversation, um, at least on the short term. Um, Tyreek Hill is allowed to be in that conversation, I think. For, um, but I would say from the, the standpoint of guys who are strong route runners, who can give you all the skills, you know, after the catch, contested <laughs> catches, play all three positions. Um, I would definitely put him, Jefferson, Neighbors, um, the whole LSU trio right up there. And I think Tyree Kill, you can probably put in there too. Um, you know, and and I know that some people will say, what about Nico Collins? And I'd say, you know, Matt Harmon, you upstart, you know, <laughs> he's good. But I don't think he's as versatile. And, I, and for me, when you say the best, I want the best who can also do it all. And I think those guys are are really the winners. And maybe they just haven't range. had to use Nico in all the ways. Nico's yet. kind of he's kind of like Harmon. He's kind of tall. He's kind of oh, oafy. He's, he's a little oafy when he moves. You know, he's he's kind of he's powerful, but he's a little bit on the he, he's <clears throat> he's not as slick of a mover. You know, uh, hmm. That's, uh, we'll, we'll discuss this further. Let's go into the other game that I thought was maybe the best game because. Well, because it was Thursday night and the bar is so low, right? I mean, like the Thursday night game, like Al Michaels is usually asleep before halftime. And I mean, this was a this was an actual game. The uh, Tampa Bay Buccaneers, Atlanta, Atlanta wins thirty six thirty. Kirk Cousins revealed himself as Kirk Cousins uh, prime time. Dark Kirk uh, came out and did the whole five hundred yard passing thing, four touchdowns. It was pretty impressive. Um, what are we gonna say here, Kirk Cousins? Uh, we have had concerns uh, in, in the month of September about his Achilles. Do we still have those concerns? Or fuck no, them? no, fuck them. I think he's done a great job, and Atlanta did a good job of being able to um, work with him and help him kind of slowly expand his confidence in that injured um, foot and be able to, and they're expanding what he's able to do in the passing game. You're seeing a lot more throws downfield a lot more throws that require velocity and maybe he's not all the way back yet and he may never be all the way back in terms of his ability to move not like he was a great mover before but he was better than what he is now he looks a little more like Philip Rivers 
um, as a mover right now compared to what he used to be. But the fact that he's throwing the ball with confidence and throwing it downfield and that's expanding in the past two to three weeks is a great sign. Um, and that just means that this offense has fewer weak spots or flaws in it for defenses to kind of take away the passing game. There's going to be mo- there may be a team or two they encounter down the line that figures something out, and he has he throws up a clunker and and he looks like he's completely lost or just like melts down a little bit. And he still has some of those. I'm going to try and be a hero. And Kyle Brandt, hero ball is not a good thing. Okay. When you go on air and talk about that that was a hero ball throw, that everyone knows, other than maybe you, that it is a it is actually a bad thing. It's trying it's hubris trying to do too much when you and you've trying to write a check that your body can't cash um, or your technique can't cash. But you know, Kyle Brandt's very popular. So what we're going to probably end up seeing. Flash so yeah, star, exactly. Plus red carpet. I got snubbed by Russell Wilson. So I'm going to go bitch about him. Um, is, you know, one of those situations where really he's going to end up making this like a positive thing to the masses. Like hero balls, actually, actually good thing. When like every, all of us who've been like on social media and talking about football for years are going to be like, you just turn something that has a, uh, a pejorative connotation into a positive connotation, but you know that's the way. That's how We're um, do social culture works. Kyle Brett, we Kyle might Brett, in, in and, five and years. It might end up happening. Of lots of fuckums. On <laughs> there there might be. I'll, I feel that he's. I feel rugs? Ross Tucker though. So. What about the angry rugs? Angry rugs. Angry runs. Oh, angry runs. Like every week, I like angry runs. I like I. You know what? Feeling Listen, the angry runs. I'm, right. I'm feel. I'll say this. I'm feeling that he used to play running back. All right. Let's, I'm. Let's I'm see. feeling that. All right. We'll give him that. Darnell Mooney and Drake London. Uh, I think this feels obvious. Are they being schemed effectively? And more to the point, is Darnell Mooney the difference maker in this offense? Right now, yeah. Darnell Mooney's kind of like the the Adam Thielen, Stefan Diggs, like kind of a kind of a mashup of those two guys because they're using him over the middle in ways like digs, but then they're also using him a little bit like Thielen on the outside at certain moments with certain trust throws. Um, and cousins obviously is, you, you know, doing a great job of targeting him and Darnell Mooney's a probably the best route runner on the team. London is being used more like a big slot receiver which on one end I really like because he's getting open in the middle. He's got that big body, big target, and he can get yards after the catch. His first touchdown, he ran through some people after catching in the middle. But where I'm a little a little bit of a head-scratcher with this is they Cousins targeting Darnell Mooney on back shoulder throws up the boundary where you really want to have a receiver with length and size to win some of those plays, and Mooney hasn't made – didn't really come through on those plays. And then London, they're not using him at all in that capacity. It would just seem to me it's a more natural fit. It's a little counterintuitive with what they're doing. But that's my only kind of complaint about it. Otherwise, I like what they're doing. I like how they're using London, and it, I think it's paying off. I, I, like, I think Kirk Cousins is going to unlock a lot of things. Is, is he ever – let's just stop on the Kyle Pitts thing here. Is Kyle Pitts – what is Kyle Pitts? He's a move tight end at who who probably for fantasy managers. For fantasy, what is Kyle Pitts? He's a low end tight end one, and I think he's gonna eventually work his way up to that now that this offense is expanding. All right, we'll go with that. Rashad White and Bucky Irving, I think we've like you know, kind of framed this as an either or which one it's both, isn't it? It is both. And when you watch this game, I, I my first thought was this referendum on him, on who's more talented, like one's talented and one's not, is just dumb. Okay? I mean, it's just it's just dumb. Because when you watch it, really what you should be looking at is reframing is which plays are working best as in terms of how the offense is executing it outside of the running backs. Because watching that game, I watched... Rashad White, and there were a number of plays where the blocking just sucked, okay? And they run a lot of gap plays with him, and 
some of the plays that he made the most of was on Rashad White. It wasn't on, and it was because in spite of the offensive line and the scheme. Whereas with Bucky Irving, it was like he made some good plays and he executed them well, but there were some big holes that Rashad White would have done just as well with that. And then, and you look at this game and if anything, what was funny is there was a red zone sequence where the, the Bucks just staff just overthought everything. They said, okay, we've got a big back who's powerful, who's gotten better at running downhill and hitting tight creases and can run through some people's faces. And we're going to give those types of plays to a shrimp with quickness who like gets four yards, but then runs, then basically gets decleated by a linebacker. And then we're going to take a quick hitter off to the, to the edge on a pass play that, where he's going to have a one-on-one with a cornerback. And while Rashad White's a good pass catcher, you want that to Bucky Irving because there's not a lot of room there to operate. You want that slippery guy to make the catch and turn up field. And then they throw that to Rashad White rather than giving that to Irving. I mean, it's like there's a three-play sequence like that where you're just looking at it and going, you got the wrong back for each play. Here's where we stand, people. Rashad White, Bucky Irving, both flex-level plays, capable of giving you a running back two production any given Sunday, and on occasion, running back one production with a little bit of touchdown luck. As we head into the bye weeks and more people get beat up, you're going to be glad you have whichever one you have, assuming they're not among those getting beat up. Um, Brandon, I let's catch. Uh, no victory lapping. No victory lapping. But my in and out column on Saturday, I was all in on Brandon. I <laughs> because sometimes don't you just feel like the momentum, it get, the, the balance gets so far out of whack that at some point they have to correct the situation. I felt like this Arizona game was, and by the way, the in and out, it's great. It's a uh, logic based hot takes. Um, I'm not a hot take artist, but I do try to uh, go get edgy and uncomfortable. But and I don't think Brandon Ike was edgy or uncomfortable. Just I had him well ahead of our rankings. This looked like the game was it was going to happen, but it was inevitable, wasn't it? I mean, Brandon Ayuk is was not going to be the third option in this receiving core uh, over the course of the full season. That was yeah. never going to happen. Yeah, no way, no how. He's the best route runner on the right. team. He's he's an excellent. He's the second best player after the catch. Um, so. Really, he's their top receiver, and and you saw Brock Purdy regularly feeding him, and there were just a lot of just misses in the previous weeks leading up to it. It's the, it was the preseason for him because right. again they had their contract issues. Um, but watching that game, you know there were some great opportunities there with placement between him and um, Purdy and Ayuk and in coverage, good run after the catch skills, some strong routes, good anticipation between them. <laughs> they were just connecting well, and you could see that that rapport. Um, finally solidified again, and yeah. he's heating up and expect a, a good run of strong games from him. Yes, happy to happy to get one of my in-outs right this week. Actually, two. Deontay Johnson was my out. And, hey, uh, if you're going to be edgy and you get one right, that's a good thing. Deontay I, Johnson was my out, so I, I nailed both my receivers. Good. I think I got I think my Jerome Ford call came up a little short though. Turns out he'd be good. <laughs> he'd be better. As one of my friends said, he'd be better than both those backs in Tampa. Turns out that like a functional offense is part of the requirement for almost anybody to have some success. I thought maybe the running back could get away in a great matchup. I was wrong. Uh, we'll get into Cleveland at some point here in the near future. Um, the 49ers still capable of winning the NFC West, or Absol- still most likely. Absolutely. I mean, look, there were two tip passes for interceptions, so you can't really go off on Purdy about that. There were, there were good plays um, by the defense. There was a fumble in the red zone from Jordan Mason, and that was the difference in this game against the uh, Arizona Cardinals. So, you know, Purdy played well. This defense is good. They've got some decent special teams work. It was just one of those games that um, things fell apart and there were mistakes that they couldn't recover from. Um, But all the components are there. I mean, Jordan Mason is playing really good otherwise. Um, Purdy's attacking downfield. If you want to look at more at Purdy, I did a progress report at him at Matt Waldman's RSP, um, dot com site or my YouTube channel, Matt Waldman's RSP Film Room. Did 20 minutes showing just the sophistication of his play and how good of a rece- um, player he is down the field as a vertical thrower and how good he is in the pocket. I think people are starting to wake up and see that this guy may never be like Kyler Murray in terms of making huge gains. Um, But at the same time, he can buy time very well, find receivers downfield, and also get some 
necessary yardage if need be. Um, this they're in good hands with Brock Purdy, and I, I there's too many weaknesses with the other teams for them to consistently <clears throat> win. I think the 49ers right. are the strongest team. One of those other teams is the Rams. Blake Corum uh, had like eight snaps through the first four games. Against the Packers, he had 11 snaps. He had five carries, 25 yards, uh, one catch for eight yards. Is this the beginning of a decline or at least a setback for Kyron <laughs> Williams investors? No. Fuck that. And I love like Corum and what he can do. But Kyron Williams is being counted on for pass protection. There were two plays in this game where he took on a defensive end and a defensive tackle as a pass protector, and it was really cool-looking stuff to see how reliable he is. And he's a smart runner who you know, just plays with good technique, and I think eventually Coram will cut into Kyron Williams' time, but I think they're going to just feed Coram in more of the Ronnie Rivers role. And you're right. going to see that consistently unless Williams that's gets been hurt. the issue, right? Like everyone was panicking because it's rivers been rivers ahead of Corum, and we're going, what the hell? Uh, so I think this is just an indication of maybe that's that's maybe. always my response to Sean Payton and and not Sean Payton, um, Sean McVay, Sean McVay, and running back usage has always for like the mm. past six years has been what the hell, um, but that's okay. Uh, Devontae Adams. You might have heard he doesn't want to be a Raider anymore. Uh, there are some obvious destinations. One of them is the uh, New York Jets. We'll see if the uh, on-field general manager uh, has as much control over the front office general manager as we all suspect. And if so, Devontae Adams would uh, end up with the Jets. If that happens, would that hurt Garrett Wilson's career? Feel it or fuck it? It won't hurt it long-term. It'll help it long-term um, because he's going to get a chance to play with a player who is – basically um, the next stage of his career evolution. And he's going to learn a ton from Devontae Adams. Um, and it may even help him from an efficiency standpoint short term. He won't need 12 catches to get the yardage that he got like he did against the Vikings this past weekend. He may only need three <clears throat> or four. Um, so greedy fantasy GMs like Bob Harris will probably be upset about that a little bit. I'm Me too, but I'm you know, fine. but as long I as I don't have a lot his, of Garrett Wilson shares, I was, yeah, I was either taking AJ Brown and pick before or wait until later. Yeah, I, I, I'm here. I hear you. So, but I think that short term, it may it's going to cap his upside, but the efficiency will still pro will probably end up being a little <clears> bit stronger, um, and it will help his career long term because he's going to understand. You know, it's going to reinforce what Aaron Rodgers is trying to teach him, and and he'll learn more from a wide receiver's angle from Devontae. Yeah, I think this would be perfectly fine as well. I'm, it wouldn't it wouldn't kind of be like I, I think it's always interesting the way we look at some of these players, these receivers that come up short for a few weeks and we decide they can't play. I mean, I'm old enough to remember when Jamar Chase couldn't catch for a little while. Yeah, and, or Khalil like, I mean, Shakir, Shakir right. couldn't catch all eight. He yeah. never drops a ball now. Yeah. Right. We go through these little phases and then, you know, the, the talent in the end wins out. Um, also, I don't know if you saw that uh, receiver show on Netflix. Uh, Devontae Adams seems like kind of a dick, but I mean, and that's fine. It's, uh, so am I. It's not like that. <laughs> but, but I think this is like not unusual for wide receivers. Romeo Dubs maybe has joined the club, uh, showing not showing up for practice last week with the Packers because well, he's unhappy about his role, which which his role is basically as the primary chain mover, the second highest target getter, uh, over through four games, only two of them with his regular starting quarterback, and he's upset. Uh, did he hurt his career this week? I think there's a real possibility that he did hurt it temporarily, at least. Because I mean, if you're Devontae Adams, let's just say, you know, the diva behavior, it kind of comes with the position, right? Yeah. But when you're Romeo Dubs, don't you have to reach a certain level before you get to be a dick? Listen, man, preseason, he was the guy that I felt had the most to lose and was likely to be the one with the most to lose in this offense. And you're watching it play out, and I didn't know this personality quirk with him. But the fact that you you're complaining about this especially when one of the four is hurt and you're right. still going to be an important part of the game plan. And they decided, fuck you. You can ride the pine this week <laughs> because you didn't show up to practice and didn't tell anyone and stayed home. And you're moaning about this. <clears throat> I mean, to me, what that says is there's 
basically the Packers have upped their chances of saying when his contract's up, right. we're done with him. Right. And, and just to just to clarify, I don't know Devontae Adams. He might not be a dick. He came off like a dick in that receiver show. I mean, look, so, Kirk Cousins came across like he right. was awesome, and I right. think he's a bit of a dick. So probably so. Yeah. Um. So <laughs> so moving on from that, uh, Aaron Jones, um, Fiona fuck it. Uh, like, and this comes like as I watched the catch he made on the play, he got hurt. That looked like a wide receiver making that play. So is he the most underrated back among the established backs in football? I wish I had this queued up, but I remember watching him at UTEP making a play just like that, except maybe about 40 yards down the field at the end of a half. Um, he's always been able to make these types of plays. And he, and I remember watching him against Texas and just thinking this, you know, Texas has a, a much better defense than UTEP had in offense. And Aaron Jones just looked fantastic. I think he is the most underrated back. He's probably my favorite back in football outside of Nick Chubb. Um, just, he's tough. He has a really great feel for how to encounter obstacles that are unanticipated. Um, so he's got great moves. He's got good burst. He has terrific vision. And you can see what he could be as a receiver. I mean, this is a, I mean, Nick Mullins, this was a third and 14. Right. Nick Mullins first play after right. Sam Darnold gets hurt and throws it up on the linebacker. And he makes, I mean, everything technique wise was like what you'd want from a receiver to do. And he catches it around the outstretched arm of the, of the linebacker. Yeah, it, was it, was it was great. Impressive. He's, he he's such a great player. player. Not everything in London was great, Matt. You're going to be surprised to learn the Jets, the Jets <laughs> offense was not, it was not stellar. Uh, the Brees Hall investors, not happy. Uh, Feeler fucking, the Jets offense is stupid, specifically the play calling in the ground game. Well, this show's going to, not us, not us. We're not going to do this. But this show's going to take a victory lap over the constant mentioning of Saquon Barkley and Derrick Henry as the one-two punch you could probably get in most leagues. Um, you know, and that Brees Hall, yeah, I mean, very good and we like him. So we don't have to bitch and moan as much about it. But I will say that it was stupid. The offense was stupid. Like, I, I understand that Braylon Allen is playing well. I under, but the fact that you're taking the ball out of Brees Hall's hands as often as you are right now and the offense isn't getting anywhere and you're not allowing your back who is in a – I don't like to use the word instinctive with running backs as much as most people do. I kind of usually say fuck that. But he is an instinctive runner. And you want to give this guy a chance to get into a rhythm and play. And you're not doing that, Jets. You're not doing that well at all. And then you're also taking the ball out of the hands of Aaron Rodgers. On top of that, with unsuccessful plays that are, un that are just predictable. <clears throat> so I think right now, yeah, there's some real stupidity going on. And I think Aaron Rodgers is probably telling them that because I don't. It's hard for me to imagine Aaron Rodgers holding his. Uh, but he loves Nathaniel Hackett. <laughs> he well, you know what? Maybe he loves the Nathaniel Hackett because he can look at him and say, "You're stupid. We need to change doing this." That. Are the Jets going to make the playoffs? I think they might, because when you watch that 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 defense, that defense is good. They get pressure. The back end is really strong. I mean, when you've got. Sauce and Reed as your cover corners. Those guys are physical. They can they can hang with your top receivers. Um, they make life tough. And then on top of that, I think Aaron Rodgers is going to start heating up a bit and and finding you know he and I think he and Garrett Wilson are going to going to figure this out. They're on the verge of figuring this out. By the way, Aaron Rodgers a little beat up, got a low ankle sprain, should be fine. Yeah. Got a long turnaround to Monday night uh, yeah. against the Buffalo Bills. Yeah, he'll be fine. I think they make it. Is 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 Travis Etienne going to be fine, or is or is Tank Bigsby just better than him? No, Tank Bigsby is not better than Travis Etienne. Um, but Tank Bigsby is a good back, and I think that at I think that what you see is that Tank Bigsby is probably a better downhill runner than Etienne has been. But Bigsby's also getting some of the closeout touches. It's this is kind of being that whole Rashad White Bucky Irving referendum starting to form. Um, that doesn't need to. 
Bigsby's a good running back two type of player on a good team. He could maybe even be a top 12 guy. This was something I talked about almost <laughs> exactly a month ago in, in my gut check column. You'll see, you can see the film on it. Um, he is what he is, which is a, a solid fantasy player that you can have right now. I think we should just acknowledge this has been the desired outcome since Tank Bigsby's arrival last year. Yeah. Right. They wanted this. They so the problem was the year before. What what did we see? ETM with like a seventy plus percent share of the running back touches. They felt like that was too many for Travis ETN. So they bring in Bigsby. He he looked all the rage last summer, uh, in the summer of twenty twenty three. We all got very excited that it turned out he did not know how to secure the football properly, uh, and took a year of coaching to get caught up on that. And now he has become the thing they wanted him to be, which is going to be a limiting factor on on Travis Etienne, but not. He'll never be the. He's not. He's not there to be the lead piece. That's Travis. Yeah, he's Etienne. yeah. He's probably more like a Kareem Hunt type of player. Um, <clears throat> in his on the other career. hand, Alec Pierce totally there to be the lead piece in the Colts receiving core, right? <laughs> I would say no, but stay tuned because he might be that. He might actually be what people are thinking. Ad Mitchell was supposed to be this year, which is. A fantasy starter who you just have to ride out the bad weeks because when the good weeks come, they're really good. It was going to be one of those two, right? I mean, yeah. like, you know, we knew Pierce had the, has this in him, just hadn't been able to tap into it, yeah. it seems. But I think most people were like, it's A.D. Mitchell and it's not so, Alex Pierce at all. But, but Anthony Richardson was right. He said, you know, that week one when he said, listen, all y'all forgot about Alec Pierce and I'm going to make damn sure that you don't that you're going to see. And Joe Burrows decided, you know what? I think I'm going to help make sure that sure of that too. So they're not using Pierce as well-rounded of a way as they could, um, but the way they're using him, it's generating big plays. So you might just have to ride or die with him as your wide receiver. If you have him as a wide receiver four, I would plug him in every week as a wide receiver four. As a wide receiver three, you're going to look well, for matchup by, by, by the way, Joe Flacco leading the NFL in passer rating. Anthony Richardson last in that category. Yet still, I want my Richardson back, people. I saw glimmers of hope in that one series. Come on. <laughs> I'll never let go. Never let go. Uh, Ferris Bueller took no days off, apparently. Uh, Bo Nix, uh, who Sean Payton likened to, to Ferris Bueller. Uh, is he get, Is he good? Did he, did he like he did he like him the fairs did he, he explain why to, yeah basically well I, how it came about was that if you watch the game in the third quarter there was the usual sean payton yelling at somebody and bo nix was yelling back bo yeah. nix was having none of it yeah. and so after the game they both kind of laughed it off this is you know and, and i feel like we always place too much emphasis on these things it's an emotional game you're in the middle of a heated battle and that you get in another heated battle during that heated battle is should be of no surprise at all but after the game sean pace says ah he's got a little ferris bueller in him i gotta knock that out of him every now and again so i'm not exactly sure what he meant because I, I haven't seen the movie in 100 years but but uh, everyone gotta get a big laugh out of it so does that make so him the dopey principal I guess it does, right? You know? Like, I vaguely remember, yes. That, that okay. makes perfect sense. But the Bo Nix. Like, so I felt like when I was drafting this year, he was my firewall guy in two quarterback leagues uh, if I was, like, running out of backup possibilities. And, you know, I, and I, to be fair, I thought Bryce Young might be that too. But I have way more Bo Nix. Is he going to be good? I actually think he, there's a chance. I think long-term he's going to be decent. Um, like, maybe Matt Ryan – decent depending on how good the weapons are or Kirk Cousins deep and decent as how good the weapons are um it's going to be up and down this year I just finished watching the the his um end of the Broncos um Raiders game or at least I'm about three quarters in and he's making some good throws he makes good decisions in the pocket um, I think there's still some receiver miscommunications with him that are just expected things that you see with rookies where they're going to, he and the re, and the receivers might not be on the same page. And there's some missed opportunities where he's maybe predetermining where he's going to go in certain down and distance situations, like hmm. being backed up in his red zone and going, you know what, I'm not even going to look at the skinny post that it actually broke open and could have gotten like 20, 30 yards, maybe even a touchdown. Three yards down the and field. let Come me on. just, and let me just go to this check down to Javante Adams. But right. he is, he is, over the past two to th two out of the past three weeks, he has taken advantage of more downfield throws, 
And I think that a lot of this is the function of the offense um, and that they want to that they want to give him room to expand rather than throw everything at him. You know, they're not doing the Caleb Williams where it's like, you know, you're driving the, you're driving the fucked up car on in Atlanta highway, you know, Atlanta traffic where everything's going 80 miles an hour and you've got, you know, a tire that's wobbling and the engine light that's coming on and you got the, the manual on the, on the steering column and you've never driven manual before like that. Whereas, like, you know, Jane Daniels has the electric car that has the the, <laughs> the system that when the traffic gets hairy, he can press the button and go, scheme play, scheme play, you know, and kind of do that. Bo, Bo Nix is a little bit in between of those with that going on, and he's not as skilled as those two guys. But I don't think – um, but I do think that he could be a competent <clears throat> quarterback, and I think it's going to get better for him as the season goes along quietly uh marking down another notch on my Jaden daniels i am right belt thank you um <laughs> here's another one here's another one I'm gonna, uh, this is not a question this is a statement brock bowers is the best receiving tight end in football yeah yeah i wish i had more of them i like i was i was and this is another case where all year round i preach i preach i tell everyone don't let a less than ideal circumstance scare you away from really good receivers, yes. right? Yeah. They tend to rise above. Yeah. Said now, a thousand examples in recent years. Now, second thought of sanity, I will add that George Kittle is pretty high up there. And so is and, Travis Kelsey, and, right? Like, yeah. you know, I mean, but he belongs, are, he belongs right. in that, that there, niche true. maybe as a pass catcher. As a route runner, maybe he's a step below. But as he'll an athlete, there. he's above all these guys. Yeah, he'll get there. Yeah. I'm just upset that I let the circumstances that he was going into yeah. cloud my view of what of the talent and the ability and a good lesson for me, Bob Harris. I don't get many lessons, man. I know most everything, right? So uh, when, when I get a good lesson, I like to acknowledge it. Thank you, Brock Bowers, for taking me to the woodshed and showing me what it's all about. Well, that's what that's what us Georgia boys do. <laughs> oh, there we go. <laughs> all right, everybody. We're done with this week. We'll be back for next week, uh, week six. It just keeps going, Matt. Love Flying. you. Bye. Bye. Love you.